<clears throat> Good morning. morning. Welcome to our service for the second uh, Sunday of Advent, December 10th. Uh, we have a few announcements. First of all, uh, there is a new movie out now. Uh, we plan starting in theaters on uh, the 12th, which is uh, Tuesday. Uh, it is the Christmas uh, at the Chosen, as part of the Chosen series. We're trying to get a group together to view the movie next uh, Sunday night, the 17th at 7 p.m. And with uh, senior tickets are approximately $10. If anybody's interested in going to that movie and uh, getting into the group, uh, please see Mickey Klutz, and he can give you further details. Uh, will we have any choir practice? Um, we already did. We're done. I'm sorry? We're finished. We already have. Okay. Reminder, next, next Sunday will be our Christmas luncheon uh, here at, after the service. Uh, your session will be providing the meal, and we would ask that anybody bring desserts, uh, your favorite dessert, uh, which will be enjoyed by all. Lighting of the Advent candle, we'll have the second lighting today. Uh, also, the outdoor lighting, outdoor candles are now um, installed and up, and the first two are lit. Um, this Wednesday, we'll have, be having another uh, food for body and spirit. Uh, on the menu will be hot dogs, baked beans, and macaroni and cheese. Uh, also, the Salvation Army is looking for volunteers um, and bell ringers uh, helping uh, getting the gifts and uh, other items. So if anybody is interested, please get in contact with Sal the Salvation Army uh, or one of us here can provide you with the contact information. Thank you, and as we now put our minds and bodies to uh, worship. Let us pray. O oh God, who gifted the world with your presence, grant us eyes that never lose sight of your great gift, Jesus. And in this new year, give us a new vision that we might dig beneath the wrappings to the objects they cover up, the items of true and lasting value, your love and the love of family and friends those things that we carry with us for the rest of our lives. May our eyes see beyond the electric lights and objects that glitter to the light of the world, 
your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope, remembering the hope that comes in Christ. Today, we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace. The candle of peace shines bright with God's plan. The wolf will lie down and dwell with the lamb. Our guns and our weapons, our hatred and war, will give way to the gardens that heal and restore. We wait for the dream of a peaceful world where nations will come together, where war is a memory, and we eat at one table. We light this candle of peace. On this day, we remember the Lord of all who brings peace, surpassing all understanding. Please join me in our call to worship this morning. Long ago, a voice cried out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight the pathways. Something new was about to happen. God would visit God's people in a new way. Lord, open our hearts to receive this good news. Prepare us to be people of great faith and compassion as we look forward to this wondrous event you have proclaimed to us. Amen. Now let us join together our voices in song and our hearts in prayer. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free.
As last week, hear again now the words from the prophet Isaiah in the 40th chapter. And let us listen for God's word to us. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us sing together now, number 248, I want to walk as a child of the light.
Good morning. Please pray with me. Holy Father, everlasting God, creator, defender, mighty king, hear our prayer. You have given us complete forgiveness and redemption through your son, born in the middle of great oppression and depravity, ruled by kings of this world, ruled by the power of men. You sent the power of your kingdom into the world through a maiden touched by the Holy Spirit. Israel's yearned for savior that was foretold by the prophets. This child, the Virgin Mary, will deliver, will be called Emmanuel, God with us, the Lamb of God, the Son of the Most High God. The story retold throughout the world of the Christ child's birth by the angels and the stars in the heavens. We wait for the story to unfold again and rejoice in the glory of God. Thank you for your great gift of love and mercy. Thank you for your grace that is new every day. We praise and worship you with open hearts and our true devotion. Lord, in your mercy. You have offered your power for healing the sick and infirm and have given us new hope in your word. We pray for all those we name out loud or in our hearts. Keep them in your care. We pray for all those on our prayer list and those we name here for your healing. We pray for Linda Angel, Barbara, David, for Kiara and her mother, for Mike and Carolyn, Sammy and Ellen, and for Jennifer, and our families and each other. We pray for our church, our pastor, our session, and our neighbors and friends. We pray for all those serving in other places, living lives of service as an example of Jesus' life. We pray for those traveling to arrive safely. We pray for a true spirit of Christmas be shown through our actions and compassion for those in need. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are victims of violence and war, for those who are hungry and homeless, for victims of disaster and prejudice. As we share what we have with them, we send the blessings that come from our Father and Creator. We pray for justice and for understanding for all those seeking to find it here. We pray for all Christians around the world celebrating the birth of a Savior that came and lived among us to give us life. We pray that your message of peace and joy be in our hearts toward all. You are the light in our lives and the love that keeps the darkness from us. You are the hope that frees us and forgives a contrite heart. You are slow to anger and abundant in kindness. You are our God and we are your children. And we thank you and praise you and call on your name. Help us be the servants you need to love and serve your people. We ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our hymn of preparation is hymn number 156, and Jordan's banks, the Baptist cry.
Hear now a reading from selected verses of the first chapter of John. And let us listen for God's word to us this morning. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts and minds be pleasing to you, and may they prepare us for the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we do pray. Amen. First, a few exchanges that actually took place inside a real courtroom. These are actual words from actual witnesses. Or at least, that's what I've been told by a lawyer or two. And we know they never stretch the truth, right? (laughs) A witness was called to the stand and the attorney asked for his date of birth. July 15th, the man replied. What year? asked the attorney, to which the witness responded, Every year. Another time, a lawyer was cross-examining a witness in a trial concerning a shooting incident. The truth of the matter, said the lawyer, is that you are not an unbiased, objective witness, are you? Because you also were shot in the fracas, weren't you? And the witness replied, No, sir, I was shot about halfway between my fracas and my navel. (laughs) Another attorney asked a witness what her brother-in-law's name was. Barofkin, she replied, and what's his first name, asked the attorney. I can't remember, she said. Do you mean to tell me, said the attorney, that this man, has been your brother-in-law for 45 years and you can't recall his name? No, she said, I'm too excited. And then she stood up and pointed out into the courtroom. Nathan, Nathan, she shouted, for goodness sake, tell him your first name. (laughs) And finally, a little boy was called to the witness stand during a case and the attorney wanted to be sure that the child understood that he could not just answer by nodding his head yes or shaking his head no, he would have to speak. Gary, the lawyer said, all of your answers today will need to be oral, okay? And Gary nodded his head and said, oral. So then the lawyer asked, how old are you, Gary? And Gary looked right at him and replied, Oral. 
This just goes to show that it's not always easy to get a good witness. And good witnesses are important in a legal trial. Good witnesses are those who make you believe what they say is true. John was a good witness. In fact, he was one of the best. Mark refers to him as the baptizer. In Matthew, he's called the Baptist. In Luke, he's known as the son of Zechariah. Here in this telling of the story, John is first and foremost a witness. Indeed, the verb to bear witness appears 33 times in this particular gospel. And only twice in the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke combined. John is a witness. And the role of a witness is to testify to the truth as best they can. The witness is called to give evidence that is believable. A witness is one who has seen something and then tells others what they have seen. So the religious authorities in Jerusalem send some priests and Levites to call John to the witness stand. People were coming out to the Jordan River to be baptized by him, and the powers that be wanted to know what was going on. Just who did this fellow think he was? That's the question they asked. What did he have to say for himself? And John gave them an answer much better than little Gary, although it may not have seemed so to those priests and Levites. Rather than explain to them who he was, he told them all about who he was not. Right here at the beginning of the conversation, John the witness makes it abundantly clear that he is not the Messiah. And he is not Elijah, who is expected to appear as a prelude to the coming of the Messiah. And he is not the prophet like Moses, whom the Lord promised to send in order to lead the people of Israel. John knew that this wasn't about him. He was not the central character in this story. He didn't claim the spotlight at all. I'm reminded of what people in politics sometimes refer to as a Sherman statement or a Sherman speech. In 1884, some Republicans were trying to get the famous Civil War general, William Tecumseh Sherman, to run for the presidency. And you may know what he said to them, even if you didn't know that it was called a Sherman speech. Sherman told them something like this, If drafted, I will not run. If nominated, I will not accept. If elected, I will not serve. Sherman wasn't about to let anyone make him president. He refused to claim the spotlight. As far as he was concerned, he wasn't a candidate for the job. This election would not be all about him if he had any say-so in the matter. Likewise, John the witness takes every opportunity to run from the spotlight. He's not a candidate for the job of Messiah. It wouldn't be John who would bring in the kingdom of God. This is not all about him. And it's not all about us either. And this is especially important to remember at this time of the year when the focus tends to be on the decorations or the presents, or the special events, or the family feasts. There's nothing inherently wrong with any of that, of course, yet it's not to take center stage during this season. It's not what Advent or Christmas are all about. We, too, are not the Messiah. The Presbyterian Church is not the light of the world. It will not be us who bring in the kingdom. Our call is not to grab the spotlight and shine as brightly as we can. The mission of the church is not to make people pay attention to us, 
It's not to get people to follow us, and it's not to tell everyone how great we are or how wonderful our church is. In a classic comedy routine from many years ago, and I wish I could have found a clip of it, Mel Brooks portrays a 2,000-year-old man being interviewed by Carl Reiner. Reiner interviews him and asks him what his life has been like and what changes he's noticed over the centuries. And at one point he asks if people had always believed in the Lord. No, says the old man. We had a guy in our village named Phil, and for a time we worshipped him. You worshipped a guy named Phil? Why? The interviewer asks. Because he was big and mean and he could break you in two with his bare hands, answers the old man. Well, did you have prayers, asks the interviewer. Yes, would you like to hear one, says the old man. Oh, Phil, please don't be mean and hurt us or break us in two with your bare hands. So when did you start worshipping the Lord, asks the interviewer. Well, said the old man, one day... A big thunderstorm came up, and a lightning bolt hit Phil. We gathered around, and we saw that he was dead. And then we said to one another, There's something bigger than Phil. There is something or someone bigger. There is something or someone greater. That is what John the witness has to say. That is his testimony. John testifies that the light of the world has come among us. And we gather as the church, but there's something greater than any church. We gather as families, but there's something greater than every family. John the witness invites us to be a part of something greater than ourselves. We are invited to be a part of a story that stretches all the way back to the beginning of creation. A story that extends all the way into eternity. As I think I have mentioned in another sermon, the Swiss pastor and professor Karl Barth was perhaps the greatest theologian of the 20th century. And for the last 47 years of his life until his death, he kept a picture above the desk in his office. It's a reproduction of a painting by Matthias Grunewald, a German painter from 500 years ago. The painting, as you can tell, is of the crucifixion of Jesus, Christ on the cross, stands at the center of the scene. And then to his right, your left, are the small figures of his mother, Mary, overcome with grief and being held up by the beloved disciple. And Mary Magdalene kneeling in humble adoration. And to his left, your right, is the small figure of John the witness. John is pointing his finger directly at Jesus. And you can't tell probably in this reproduction, but there are words in the background, words that John will speak later in this very gospel. He must increase, it says, but I must decrease. Bart kept that picture over his desk to remind him that this is the task of every theologian, every pastor, and indeed everyone who desires to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Our job is to point to Jesus. Our job is to witness to something greater than ourselves. There is a power greater than any illness that may afflict us. There is a healing that is greater than all of our wounds. There is a gift available to us that is greater than all the presents under all the trees in all the world. 
There is a light that is greater than all of our darkness. And all of our darkness cannot overcome it. There is a love greater than death itself. Even though we are not worthy to serve him, even though we are not worthy to untie his shoes, we are called to testify that there is one who is greater. We are called to testify to the light. But the light is not a spotlight for us to stand in and point to ourselves. A writer once remembered taking a class from uh, Dr. Papaderos, a Greek theologian. And the professor had asked the students if there were any final questions on the last day of the class. So the writer, mostly as a joke, asked him, So, professor, what is the meaning of life? And Dr. Papaderos pulled out of his pocket a small round piece of glass. It was part of a mirror that he had found shattered on the road when he was a boy. And he explained to the class how this piece of glass fascinated him. He delighted in shining and reflecting light into dark places, he said, where the sun would never shine in deep holes and crevices and dark closets. And it became a game for him to try and shine the light into the darkest, dimmest places he could find. And he kept the mirror as he grew up, and he would occasionally take it out and continue that little game. I am not the light, the professor said, but there is light, and I can reflect it. This is the meaning of my life. Let this be the meaning of my life and your life also. Let this be our witness. We are not the Messiah, but we can testify to the Messiah. We are not the light of the world, but there is light that we can reflect. There is something or someone greater who has come into the world. Christ stands at the center of this season and every season. And we need only point to him to be good witnesses so that all may believe. Let it be so in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Together, we will pray the prayer of confession. Into the dark depths of our fear and anguish, you, O oh Lord, reach out to us. We need your guidance today, for we have found it far too easy to stray into selfish pathways. We seek first our own comfort we gather our toys and trinkets and proclaim that all is right with the world. Yet, our hearts feel strangely discomforted. Guide us and gather us, Lord. Teach us again to be the people of peace and hope. Help us to cast off the mantle of greed and hatred. Forgive us for the many times when we have ignored the cries of those in need, when we have turned backs on opportunities to help others. Forgive us, Lord. Touch our hearts and bring your bright light of salvation to them that we might turn again to you and in your love may be part of ministries of peace and justice. Help us again to hear the voice of one who cries in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we offer this prayer. Amen. Our assurance of pardon. God's forgiving love has been poured upon each one of us. Hear the good news. You are healed and forgiven. Amen. Our offertory hymn is O Little Town of Bethlehem, number 180.
Let us pray. Holy God, your heart abounds with gifts. And so receive our offerings as signs of our trust in you and our intention to live surrounded by your mercy, inspired by your spirit, open to the joy of your presence, hospitable to one another, and generous toward your world. We pray in the name of the one who comes as the Prince of Peace, Jesus, your Son. Amen. Friends, as we now depart from this place and this time of worship, let us go and let us reflect the light. Let us bear witness to Jesus Christ and point to him. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessing and power of the Holy Spirit be not only your witness, but be your companion and surround you forevermore. Amen.